Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. My name is Ian McNay and today our guest in the studio is Bruce Lipton. Hi Bruce. Hi Ian, thank you so much for this opportunity. So Bruce has written a book which came out five years ago, Biology of Belief, which has sold really, really well. And he has a new book out fairly recently, which I had the talking book of, Spontaneous Evolution. And we're going to talk to Bruce a little bit about his history and how he got to be a, bi a biologist and how he had certain realizations about how the body works and how, in fact, life works. And also we're going to talk about the contents of both books. So let's start first of all, Bruce with an experience you had when you were seven years old at school and you first looked into a microscope. So I think that was the beginning of a change in your life, wasn't it? Well, it, it was absolutely a big change in my life. You know, being a little kid of seven years old, the whole world is bigger than you are. And when I looked into a microscope for the first time and saw like an amoeba moving around and a paramecium darting about here and there, in my little child mind, I thought, oh my gosh, they're, they're not like pinballs bouncing around. They, they have intentions. They're moving. They're, they're like little people. So I grok this idea of cells are like miniature people. And I'm very excited because there was a world smaller than me. So it was like a, as a young kid, that, that became, oh, I'm looking into another world. Uh, and it's interesting because while I was seven years old when I did that, my fascination with microscopy and biology continued until I was in graduate school and had then graduated to electron microscopy and now was uh, flying through the structure of the atoms and the molecules making up a cell. So uh, basically it was seated at seven and, and, and matured by the time I got into graduate school. And your mother brought you, brought you your own microscope, so you were able to do this at leisure and find more and more about how everything worked. Oh, I, I, I was, as a kid, I just got so caught up with it. I remember I spent one entire summer because I wanted to take a photograph through the microscope. And I knew I could see it, but I, and every time I held a camera up, I tried to do it. And uh, it took me about a summer, and I finally, at the end of the summer, got a microscope after probably hundreds of dollars worth of photographic material. But it was like my persistence of I wanted to... To, to see and, uh, and study these images in the microscope. So you eventually became a biologist. What did you actually learn then? Well, it was interesting because uh, I became a, um, a biologist, a developmental cellular biologist. I'm working on cells, of course. And uh, in my, my graduate work, I was cloning stem cells. And it's interesting because a lot of people think stem cells are something brand new that just came into this world recently. And the fact was, I was cloning stem cells back in 1967, 40 years ago. And the significance was, while I was doing this research, I was also teaching medical students. So I was teaching medical students the foundation of how cells work, the conventional story out of the textbook, genes control life, what we call the genetic determinism, the belief that genes control your traits, behavior, your physical characteristics, etc. And what my research revealed when I was studying the stem cells was this, very profound. I put one stem cell in a petri dish all by itself, and it would divide every 10 to 12 hours. So it would be 2, 4, 8, 16 cells, 32 cells. After about two weeks, I have thousands of cells in the petri dish, but what was unique? They were all genetically identical. But then I did the experiment. The experiment was to take some cells out of the dish and put them into a separate dish with a different environment. Okay. And so the environment is a culture medium, but the culture medium to cells is like the world that we live in. It's got the air, the water, the food, all the things in it. So I take the cells out of my stem cell dish, put them in a separate dish with a, a different environment, and the cells form muscle. But then I went back to the same dish with genetically identical cells in it and took some cells out and put them in a different environment, and they form bone. And then I went back to the same dish with genetically identical cells and put them in a third Petri dish with a different environment, and they form fat cells. And there I was confronted with this reality. All the cells are genetically identical, but they had different fate, fat, muscle, bone. And I say, simple question, what controls the fate of cells? And the answer is the environment. It was the only thing that was different because they were all genetically identical. So I started to really say, oh, my goodness, here I am teaching genes control life to the medical students, and yet the cells were revealing to me that, hey, they all had the same genes, but it was the environment that I put them in, and so the environment controlled their life, and a very simple experiment that is very profound for us today is if I took my dish with plastic petri dish with cells in it and moved it from a healthy environment to a less than healthy environment, the cells get sick. And if I were a doctor of cells, I, you might say, well, what kind of drugs would you give these cells? And it turns out 
No, you don't give the cells any drugs. You just take the dish from the bad environment, put it back into a good environment, and the cells will innately, naturally come back to health again. So how did this realization impact you at the time? Because you, you were teaching something completely different. Yes. You did this experiment and you realized what you were teaching wasn't the full truth. Oh, absolutely. And, and then I had a problem with my colleagues because, first of all, they doubted my work and then I brought them into the experiments and I had them observe them, watch them, and they all said, wow, yeah, the environment controls the cells. Uh, but they wanted to marginalize it, so they would say, oh, that's an exception or an anomaly because we're teaching genetic control. It didn't fit the story. Uh -huh. The net result, what it led me to do was, I had tenure. I had tenure at the university. I walked out of the university and said, look, I, I can't keep my integrity and at the same time teach something I know was patently wrong. Uh, so I walked out because I saw that teaching the belief that genes control life was very, very incorrect. And uh, it's very interesting because I did that in 1970. Now that's like 30, uh, 40 years ago. And guess what? the new science that is just coming into the forefront of our world today is, is something called epigenetic control. What I was teaching was genetic control, control by genes. The new science which is now coming around is called epigenetic control. And what that means, in the, you understand the prefix epi means above. So you say epidermis, that means the layer above the dermis skin. If I say epigenetic control, literally it says control above the genes. And this is the new science, and why is it profound? Because when you teach genetic control, you teach victimization. You didn't pick the genes as far as we know. The genes control your traits. You can't change the genes, so uh, you become victimized by your heredity. Uh, and the new science, epigenetic control, reveals how your response to the environment uh, as you change your response to the environment, you change the fate of your cells, just like in the Petri dish. Uh, uh, and that makes you a master because you are the one that has the opportunity to change your perception and response, so therefore you're the one that controls your genes. But it took you some time, didn't it, to actually incorporate that in your life? Because I know in the Biology of Belief, your book, you talk about you went through a very unhappy period, yes. your father was dying of cancer, you had a very messy divorce from your first wife, and you weren't happy. And you thought at that point that actually your genes did influence and you had unhappy genes and it took you some time to actually realize that in your life you could change things. Yeah, it was very interesting because again I was still coming from the programs of my own deep beliefs which I got from childhood on uh, about genetic control and yet it was funny because I was at that point also going out and beginning to talk to people about this new science about if you understand what I'm talking about you can create this fabulous life and it was fun because in the beginning I would try to get people together and I'd tell them you can create this fabulous life and they'd sit at me and look and go you know Lipton for a guy who says you you can create a life with, with this stuff your life doesn't look that good and, and, and essentially I almost said fortunately I didn't say the words but I essentially said well do as I say not as I do and that was the opening point that said oh my god I can't just talk about the academics of the new science to make it work you actually have to apply the principles of the new science and that was a change point in my life where I said well I'm not going to lecture on this unless I verify to myself that by influencing my personal beliefs and attitudes and things that I can change my biology and it was wonderful because it only took just a short time to realize how I manifest profound changes in my life by taking in the understanding that how I see the world my perceptions uh, control not just my internal biology and my genetics and behavior but it controls how I create in the world around me so I went from a world of almost self-destruction into this world of more mastery and and the most exciting thing is I found since that time that I have I absolutely live in heaven because I've created but, a but life. Let, let, let's look at practically how you did that just so people pick up a few clues okay well the first thing is this the, the work showed that your mind's perception of the world changes your biology the chemistry of your body uh, which changes your cells and I said, okay, so if you control how your mind operates, then you can control your chemistry. But then here's where the problem comes from. There's two parts to the mind. The conscious mind, which has your personal identity, your spirit, your source attached with it, is a creative mind. The conscious mind can see into the future, can review the past, solve problems. The subconscious mind, the other mind, 
is more of a habit mind. That's when you learn how to do something, and once you learn how to do it, you don't have to think about it. It's automatic. Well, most of us walk around in the world thinking that we're running our lives with our creative mind. And I'd say, Emmett, what do you want out of your life? And you would say, oh, I want to uh, be healthy. I want to have great relationships. And, and then you try to say, I'm running my life with these beliefs. But science has now revealed that we only run our lives with our conscious mind at most about 5% of the time. So we're running on these subconscious programs. 95% yeah. of the time. Okay. And then the issue is, well, where'd you get the fundamental programs that you yeah. operate from? And here's the, the thing I learned is that it's in the first six years of our lives that the brain is in a functional state, an EEG state, the electrical activity, that is not even in consciousness. A child doesn't even reach conscious brain function until about six. So the first six years of your life, your brain function is lower frequency. It's called theta, which is like a hypnagogic trance, a hypnosis. So the first six years of your life, you're like a television camera recording everything around you, everything you observe, just going in from your uh, observations into your programming. So we acquire beliefs and attitudes and behaviors, not from ourselves, but from our parents and our family and our community. These become the fundamental beliefs. Uh, a very interesting point. Uh, the Jesuits had, were very proud. They would say, give me a child until it's six or seven, and it will belong to the church for the rest of its life. What they were saying was what they knew, which science is now finding out. The first six years are programming. Yes. And whatever program you get, that will be the rest of your life. So that's why they said, just give me the first six years. And it turns out they were precise. The, the first six years is download a program, and that's when you get your behaviors from those around you. So you were able, by realizing this, to then look at how you were living your life on a practical level and say, I am not going to be governed by these pre-programs. I am going to live my life in a more conscious way. Am, am I oversimplifying well, this? Yeah, it, it, it's, that's a, a fundamental statement of how it works, but it's not as easy yeah, as, oh, okay, that. I've just yeah. changed my thinking about yeah. it. It's like, yeah. well, because as the, the thinking is not that much in our control. The brain is operating, as I said, 95% from the yes. subconscious. Uh, but, uh, but, but how did you actually then get results in a, f a relatively short space of time? Well, the, the first thing, how does the subconscious learn? And that's a very critical thing. Uh, the conscious mind can learn from reading a book. So you, the subconscious mind can read a self-help book and you go, wow, that sounds really great. And then you find you read the book, but your life is still the same. And it turns out, why? And the answer is because the subconscious mind is more of a habit mind, things that you repeat over and over again. Yes. Yeah. So the reality is, if you can stay conscious, be present, and when those negative thoughts come in our head, and, and psychologists tell us 70% of the time, the thoughts that are going through our head are negative and redundant. So the same negative thoughts are going through. If you could stop those thoughts, if you could hear them as they come through, like, oh, that's not going to work, or this will never happen, them, those and stop them consciously, say, no, uh, uh, change the belief right there. Just give the more positive thing. As you repeat this more frequently and you keep repeating it, the subconscious mind begins to learn. So as a habit, if okay. you stay conscious and you have to work at it, and, and here's why people say, well, how come only 5% from conscious mind, 95 for, from subconscious? Because a conscious mind can think into the future and think into the past and solve problems, then think about it yourself. Most of the time, you're thinking about something. Well, if you're thinking, you're using the conscious mind. Well, if you're using the conscious mind for thinking, then who's running the show? And the answer is, when you're not paying attention and you're thinking about what I'm going to do tomorrow, your subconscious is running the so show. So you use the words be present be present which be mindful. We, we hear a lot so be mindful which really means be aware yes of what's going on what so you get an automatic reaction you're aware of that and you say i don't want to go there that's an old pattern and you look at a new way to be in that situation. Exactly. And okay. you have to repeat it over and over again yeah. because if you think, well, I, I, I got mad at myself yesterday because I repeated that same stupid thing and I got mad again today because I repeated the same stupid thing and then people give up because they get frustrated. And it's like, no, no, it's a habit. So you have to every day, but ultimately you can repeat it. Yet there are fortunately now very many new healing modalities that, uh, that can help you rewrite the subconscious beliefs much faster. So uh, I get very excited because uh, some of this may take work for people because you have to really be present. And yet we're so bombarded with information and our lives are so busy 
that our conscious mind is almost always wandering trying to resolve issues and problems and things we have to work out, which then means the subconscious mind is running the show. Yeah. Uh, and it's very interesting because most people will be very familiar with this story. I tell it to my audiences and they all laugh because they're familiar with it. I say, look, you have a very close friend. You know your friend's behavior. And you happen to know your friend's parent. And at some point, you see that your friend shares the same behavior as their parent. So, you, you know, you casually volunteer. You go, you know, Bill, you're just like your dad. And that's when you have to back away from Bill. <laughs> uh, because Bill's the first guy that says, how can you compare me to my dad? And everyone laughs because they're familiar. Uh, but I say, uh, no, there's two very profound points from that one story. And profound point number one, everybody else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. He got his programming from his dad. It's only Bill who doesn't see it. Yeah. And profound point number two. We're all Bill, because all of us got programming, and all of us operate with these programs, and we don't even see we're doing it, that we even, when told we're doing it, will deny that we do these behaviors, because we don't even see what we're doing. That's why it's called subconscious, below conscious. Because you went from, and I'm quoting from your book, wanting to be anyone but me, yes. to being, I think you quote yourself, as the happiest man in the world. You felt so happy. Oh, so my you gosh. prove that this can work. Well, I had to because I said when I first started talking about it, it was from an academic conscious point of view. This is what I learned. But my subconscious programs were still exactly the same. So, yeah. well, I had this wonderful knowledge. My life still wasn't anything I wanted to, to brag about it because it wasn't. And, uh, and as you know, that old game, well, who would you like to be? And I could think of anybody I'd rather be than me. And yet, when I started to apply the new science and rewrite the subconscious so it supported me rather than the programs of limitation or disempowerment that we get from our parents and our community as children, which almost all of us get, when I put in the new programs, all of a sudden I started to find, my goodness, my life completely turned around. Uh, all wonderful things started happening in my life. I was healthier. I haven't been to a doctor in 20 years. So I, I, I don't need that. I don't take any of their drugs. Why? Because most of the illness is just from the stress of not living in harmony. Mm -hmm. And when you learn to, to get rid of the limiting programs that we got as children and put in programs that support you, guess what? Then all of a sudden, the place turns into heaven. Uh, and it's interesting, people, I tell people, well, you create your own life. And then they look around and go, I don't want responsibility for this. But I say, well, you didn't know you were creating with these unconscious beliefs. And, uh, and yet then I tell people, especially people that have fallen in love, and the people have fallen head over heels in love. I said, go back to that time when you first fell in love. Uh, let me ask you a question. Were you healthy? And it, oh, yeah, I was, I was healthy as anything. I said, did you have energy? I said, oh, I had so much energy. made love for days in a row without even eating. And I go, oh, yeah. And I go, uh, and how was life for you? It was so exciting. I couldn't wait for the next day. So I said, in this little period that, you, you know, that I refer to as a honeymoon, I say, wasn't life like heaven on earth? And they go, well, yeah. And I go, you know, that was not an accident. That was an actual creation. And you say, but what was different that made life uh, uh, so heaven on earth during love? And the answer is because you become very self-conscious of yourself. You don't rely on the habits. The day before you meet this person, you're going to go on a date. I say, especially to women, I say, how long did it take you to get dressed? And they say, well, I was 15 minutes and I was out of the house. And then I say, now, tonight, you're going to go on a date with this person who has just rocked your world. And I say, how long does it take you to get dressed? And it's like, my God, it may take an hour or two. And I say, yesterday, 15 minutes, today, an hour or two. What's the difference? Yesterday, I got dressed by habit because I get dressed every day. Yeah. But tonight, I am looking in the mirror, meaning I am self Conscious. I am making sure that I represent myself to be the fully the best individual I can be. And when both parties are not relying on the habit, and both of them are saying, I'm creating the best I can be, they're living in the moment of the now, they're being very mindful, they're being very present, and guess what? Heaven on earth is created. But unfortunately, uh, life gets busy. It's hard and, to stay present. And they're present. meeting as well. They're truly meeting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which is also very rare, unfortunately. Well, and, and why is that important? Because it did demonstrate that you did create this period, yeah. and it's available to you all the time if you knew how not to get stuck in the old habits. But one of the things that I really found fascinating in, in, in your book is the fact we, we all have approximately 50 trillion cells in our body, and these cells are all self-sufficient. They have their own memory, they have their own immune system, and in fact, you also go on to say that for 2.75 billion years, there was only one-celled organisms on alive planet. on the planet. Yeah. And, and, and the nature is, 
as a single cell evolved to be the most intelligent it could be, it ran into a physical limitation because intelligence is physically tied up with the membrane or skin of the cell. You can only have so much membrane. Uh, so evolution apparently stopped. It was like two and a half billion years, just a single cell organism. Then it said, well, how can you have more evolution? The answer is cells decided to come together in community because when cells come into community, they share awareness. So there's more awareness with 10 cells than there is with one cell. And there's more awareness with a million or a billion or a trillion. So when you look at a human being, while we see ourselves as single entities, the truth is we are made out of 50 trillion amoeba-like cells. And so our body is this giant community. Uh, and what, what makes it very exciting, as you mentioned, is, well, in my own work with cloning cells, I can take a cell out of your body and it can live outside of you. Why? It has its own intelligence. It has, essentially, every function in your body is present in a cell. So my seven-year-old vision manifests to be true when I got older to realize cells are miniature people. And then you say, well, what about happens in the human body? And I go, this is where the issue comes in. is because you have 50 trillion cells living in community, but your mind is the government. When a government works in harmony with the people, then the people thrive and the community is, is in good health and grows. But when a government is not really supportive or not working in, in harmony with a community, then the government can cause the, the, the nature of that community to fall apart or even lead to, to, to the end of the community. Well, that's what we're finding out. Our mind is the government. And when we entertain harmony and, and the right living and balance with nature and with each other, then we provide our 50 trillion cells with very life-supporting information and chemistry. So harmony means giving the body good food? Yes. Not being stressed out? Absolutely. Living in a, in a happy environment? Yes. Uh, it basically, it says, uh, it, it's as I said, when I had my petri dish of cells, if I put it from a healthy environment to a bad environment, the cells got sick. But you didn't have to give them drugs. Uh, but all you did is take the, the dish from the bad environment and put it in a good environment. And, and the joke which I like to tell people is, well, this happens in a plastic petri dish, but guess what? We are skin-covered petri dishes. Underneath our skin is 50 trillion cells living in a dish, and the culture medium is the blood. And so when I change the culture medium in a plastic dish, I change the fate of the cells. And I say, well, then what controls the culture medium? My blood, the chemistry. And the answer is, my thoughts influence my brain and the brain releases chemistry that matches my thoughts. So when I'm in stress or I'm afraid of the world, I release different chemistry into the blood than if I open up my eyes and I find myself in love, I release completely different chemistry. And it's like, well, I, all I have to ask an individual is, how do you feel when you're in total love or how do you feel when you're in fear? And the answer is, well, I feel totally different. And guess what? All the cells are bathed in that chemistry and so the, the feeling of love produces totally different chemistry in the blood, chemistry that supports growth and healing of the body and supports the immune system. And in contrast, when we perceive reasons to be afraid and we release stress hormones into our body, we actually shut off the growth mechanisms and the immune system to, serve, to save the energy. Why? Because if you believe you're going to have to run from that lion, you want all the energy available to run from a lion. So when a person is in stress, they allocate their energy reserves for fight or flight, but take it at the expense of the health of the system, the immune part of the system. And so the more stress you're under, the more bad chemistry, in a sense, of not supporting you, you that you experience. Uh, and, and it's a very important point. In our evolution, stress or fear was not the mainstay of life. The mainstay of life was to be happy and live in the harmony of the environment. Every now and then a saber-toothed tiger would come. Okay, now it's time to be stressed out. Now it's time to run. But the point is, once you escape from the saber-toothed tiger in the old days, then it's like, oh, back to health and harmony. And I say, well, what about in today's world? Today's world is 24-7 run from the tiger. And this is not biologically sustainable because uh, the chemistry of protection uh, uh, contrast with the chemistry of growth. Yeah, it's interesting how the body, you point this out in Spontaneous Evolution, your second book, that how the body also is a snapshot of how we are as a human race. Oh, absolutely, because um, what you, we would see from a new understanding of evolution, which is a great extension beyond the Darwinian belief, belief which is quite limiting, okay, and quite troublesome, in fact. Uh, because just think about what the principal Darwinian belief is, 
uh, that evolution is based on a struggle for survival with a competition for fitness. So that says, oh my God, then our world is, we're all out there in a dog-eat-dog -dog rat race trying to survive because if you stop running, the person behind you is going to run over you. So if that's your way of life, then every day, by definition, you are living in a, a stress hormone uh, body because of all the fears that we, that we have. And yet evolution says, no, evolution is based on community and cooperation. A body has 50 trillion citizens. They live in harmony with each other. And it turns out that every human being, we're beginning to find out, is like a cell community called humanity. So in biological terms, the organism that's evolving on the planet is not the human being. We already did that. The organism that's evolving is the super organism called human civilization. And right now, humans are fighting each other and killing each other. And if I say, well, what would that look like inside the body if the cells fight each other and kill each other? And I say, oh, well, that's called autoimmune disease, self-destruction. Mm. And, and autoimmune disease can kill you from the inside. And that's on the increase, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, because, the, because our biological lives are complements to the environment. Yeah. The more stress and more violence on the outside, the more that's taken inside in biology and converted to uh, uh, disruption and disharmony of your own cellular internal community. So what can we then do as a human race? Maybe it's an obvious question, but here we are. We represent, in a way, the 50 trillion cells that are in our own bodies on a bigger scale. And here we are. We see the intelligent ones, the ones that are really looking, are seeing what happens inside their own body. They're seeing what happens on the outside. But, as you mentioned again, in spontaneous evolution, there's also the consensus reality. Yes. And even though individual people can see what's happening, what can they actually do when there's this whole other, I suppose, stronger force playing its part? Well, you're right. I mean, it's a stronger force because everybody's mind is like a tuning fork. Because actually you can read brain activity from outside your head with a new thing called magnetoencephalograph. Most people are familiar with electroencephalograph, put wires on your head and read your brain function. Okay. Yeah. The new one, magnetoencephalograph, they put a probe out here. And they can read your brain function from outside. Well, it's a very important point. He says, well, if you're reading my brain function from outside, then what am I doing? I must be broadcasting my brain function. So all of us are like tuning forks. But if we're all out of tune, then there's a tendency for even a tuning fork that tries to stay in tune will be pushed out of tune by something we call entrainment. And the issue is, how can you survive in this world? And the answer is you must essentially detach yourself from this field around you, not be taken in by the stories, not be buy into the fear, not to buy into the threats on our existence, to start to recognize, look, we are creating these lives. If you buy other people's creation, then you manifest what they're creating. If you want what you want, then you have to not get engaged. And the more conscious you become, the less you are affected by the outside fields. And so this rising consciousness that we're seeing is the evolution of humanity to rise above the noise of the background and recognize you are the creator, just like we talked about. If you can create a honeymoon for yourself while you're in love and everyone started to create a honeymoon for themselves, then all of a sudden, the concept of war and violence would disappear because if everybody's in love and everybody's in harmony and everybody's so excited by being here, then the competition and violence that we live by because of today's beliefs would disappear. And the reality is we are moving in that direction right now. Day by day, more people are taking back the power of saying, I'm not buying your belief. You have to be consciously stand apart, don't you? And yes. Say, I'm not going to be part of this. Right. And it's interesting because a lot of people say, well, I'm going to go in there and fight that system. And I go, you know, that's not really good either because yeah. if you're fighting the system, then you're contributing energy, whether it's pro or con, to that system. The way to fight the system is not to be part of the system. Uh, and it's fun because I talked to some British people I know, and they were, I forgot what they were called, but they were people who are somewhat living all through England, but nobody knows where they are, who they are. They're sort of out there, and they're having this life independent uh, of, the, of the government, even knowing who they are. Uh, and it's like some level, of, we all have to start doing that. But when we do that, then we'll find there's more of us than the other ones. And then all of us who are on the outside of the system actually become the new system. So it becomes this critical point where things start to shift, you feel? Yeah, and yeah. I think we're really approaching that with 2012. And I think that is a very auspicious beginning because it's, a, uh, it's not a mystical thing. It's, a, it's really a change in the energy fields of the earth 
because the Earth is changing its position in relationship to the Milky Way. Uh, so basically, uh, the, the energy that comes from, from all the stars uh, and the sun especially influence who we are. When we change our positions uh, in the relationship to the field, we change our response because we evolved in the field of energy. And when the field of energy changes, so do we. Something else you talk about in the book, which I found quite fascinating, was the placebo effect and oh. the, the nocebo effect. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because a lot of people understand what the placebo effect is. And what is it? Well, uh, it's interesting because uh, medical science has revealed that from one-third to two-thirds, which is significant, of all healing, whether it's drug-related or surgery or whatever healing process, the healing didn't come about from the process. The healing came about because the person believed the process was going to heal them. So if I give you this brand new drug and it's purple colored because that makes it really special, you know. Uh, and it's funny because there is a drug, a purple drug, and they said, it's purple. And everybody's like, oh, wow, that's got to be special. But people believe that the drug holds this effect. And you give the person this drug. And all of a sudden, they heal themselves, and they say, yeah, the drug did it. And then you tell them later, but it was just a sugar pill. Uh, that, that healing didn't come from the drug. It came from the belief in the drug. So the belief in healing so is what heals you. it comes back to the mind you. again, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, it's, again, the power of belief. In this case, it's a very yeah. positive belief that this procedure, drug, or whatever is going to heal me. But what people haven't talked about, because everyone knows about the placebo effect, is that the placebo effect on a, is based on a positive thinking, what is the consequence of negative thinking? Ah, well, science has a term for it, but it hasn't really come out in the public. It's called the nocebo effect. And the nocebo effect has been revealed by science that a negative thought can not only make you ill, but a negative thought could also kill you. You can be scared to death in a, in a real sense, okay? Uh, and, and why is that important? Because it turns out it's not just the positive thought of a placebo that's influential. The negative thought works the same way with the same power but in the opposite direction. So basically it's not placebo, nocebo. It comes down simply this. It's the power of thought. And a positive thought will move you in a healing direction and a negative thought will move you into an illness direction. Uh, but before I get off that topic, I don't want people to go out there in the audience and go, oh, 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 one of those positive thinking kind of guys. And it's like, it's more than just positive thinking. It's a, a commitment and an intention of positive thinking. It also really needs the support of your subconscious belief. Because if your subconscious belief is going, oh, that new age weirdo stuff, if that's what your subconscious is programmed to believe, and yet your conscious mind is the one that says, I will think positive thoughts, and I go back to the data. Only 5% of your life is coming from the conscious mind. So if you're only entertaining a positive thought with your conscious mind, you're only contributing 5% of that to your life. 95% of your life is still coming from the subconscious. And if the subconscious doesn't hold those beliefs, then you're actually fighting yourself and not likely to realize the expression of a positive thought. So let's look at this again practically. So someone's not feeling well, they've got, I don't know, they've got the flu or yes. they've got something wrong with their stomach or something. What should they practically do? They should presumably go to the doctor and get a diagnosis. Would you go along with that? I'm just, I'm just trying to see I, I, where I, this yeah. goes in day-to-day -day life. Well, I wouldn't say don't go to a doctor, but I say before you go to a doctor, just look around and think about this. What's going on in your life? where the stress is coming from. Because it's almost uh, uh, your physiological expression is a complement to your life experiences. Those people that are happy are healthy. As I said, when you're in the honeymoon, you didn't get sick in the honeymoon. That's when you're absolutely healthy. But when you got caught back up in the real life, that's when illnesses start to occur. So we always look at, oh, I must be sick. There must be something wrong with my biology when it turns out. It didn't begin with your biology. Only about 2% of illness is actually connected to genetics, let's say. 98% of illness is not just genetics, it's environment. So when a person says, oh, I have the breast cancer gene, and people think, oh, I'm going to get breast cancer. And I say, well, wait, wait. 50% of women that have the breast cancer gene get cancer. What about the 50% that have the gene and didn't get the cancer? And we never study that side. We only study the side that got the cancer. And you find out... But what is it that the 50% do that don't have the cancer yet have the gene? What's different? The answer is their lifestyle is different. Their f stresses, their fears, their concerns are, are not the same as the one that get the illness. It, the genes are, are like give you a propensity to get a disease, but that propensity is based on how you perceive life. 
Uh, and it's interesting, uh, studies show that when children get adopted into a cancer family, yeah. the adopted child will get the cancer with the same percentage or probability as any of the natural sibling. And you say, but yeah, but the, the child came from totally different genetic stock. And the point is, yes, it wasn't the genes that promoted the cancer, it was the lifestyle that promoted the cancer, especially the lifestyle of stress. And then I say, well, if stress is causing lifestyle, and I go look around at the world, and I go, my God, no wonder everybody's sick. Every day is filled with more stress than the day before. And if you buy into the stress, you take that disharmonious vibration, essentially, bring it in your life, and you end up with disharmony inside your body. Your life is a reflection of what you see. Yeah, it's a question of going back a few steps. That's what I'm hearing. And just, yes. and just looking to see, well... I'm not feeling well, and I had the same thing last year. What's called, What's behind that? Am I happy in my life? What is emotionally happening? Absolutely. What is happening physically? Am I doing the right things to support my body? Absolutely. It's a fundamental it's very, look, yeah. isn't it? I, I don't want to say don't go to the doctor, so I, I'll go back just 20 years ago, the last time I went to a doctor. Okay. I went to a doctor because I had pneumonia. And I said to myself, well, yeah, I, I can see why but at that moment in my life there was so much stress going on in my life that I could see I, was, I had opened my system up to that. But then I also realized, okay, well, I can you know, handle this with my consciousness. But then I realized the bacteria were doubling and they're growing faster than I can handle my consciousness. So I said, okay, now's the time for some penicillin. But the concept of it was... I don't rely on the penicillin, and, I, and all I had to say was, look, I get back on my feet, and I go, it was my responsibility. And if I don't get into that same stressful situation again, then I won't have to go through this again. And it's been 20 years. So it's intelligent learning, isn't yes. it? Yes. Don't, don't discard the element of medicine until your yeah. consciousness gets high. And, and the fact is, when people have lower consciousness because they're not strong enough in their consciousness to really manifest everything they want. They really need to take care of themselves more, eat better, better nutrition, do more exercises, do these things to add to your health. But the surprising thing is, if you get more and more and more conscious, there's a point where you get so conscious, then you become like a, a, the, the, the person we refer to as Jesus, who does all these miracles. And, well, and what, did, what, what did Jesus say about the miracles? He said, you could do these better than I can do them, but you don't believe. And that is the absolute truth. Because when you fully have control of your that consciousness, belief. you do create the miracles. The miracles of spontaneous remission, for example. A person terminally ill who all of a sudden says, I'm not buying this. I'm going to change my vision of life. And the moment they change their perception, they have what's called a spontaneous remission. Again, that would be called a miracle, but what was it? taking full control of consciousness and manifesting a life of being fully conscious and present and, and seeing what brings harmony into your life and avoiding or eliminating as best you can any of the disharmony that exists on the outside because disharmony will make disharmony inside. Yeah, what, what, how I'm hearing this is the subconscious you talked about early is often unconscious yes. and by what you're talking about the subconscious, the unconscious becomes conscious. Yeah. And through that, change can happen. Where, where the consciousness can go back and review it, because the consciousness is the one that has a perspective. And, and, you, and you become your subconscious. So it's very interesting, because what I talk about is, look, uh, people healed themselves innately for a million years before there were medical schools, okay? Uh, because we are innately able to heal ourselves. You cut yourself, you don't really need a doctor to heal the cut. The cut heals by itself, uh, and all the illnesses can. But then I say, but the subconscious, which was programmed the first six years, go back to the six years, and I would say, in a conventional family, that when a child got sick in the family, or any member of the family got sick, the conventional phrase they heard was, oh, we have to take Billy to the doctor. Mom has to go to the doctor. What did we learn? That's a program that says, if I am sick, it didn't say heal yourself. That wasn't the lesson. The lesson was, when I am sick, I have to go see this doctor. And, and here's the joke, which I like about it. Because you ask a lot of people that get sick and go to the doctor and ask them, they say, you know, it's really funny. I got well on the way to the doctor or I got well waiting in the doctor's office. And I go, you know, that, that's funny, but it's not a joke for this reason. You were always able to heal yourself until you got a program. What was the program? Go to the doctor. So basically, and which I love about it, because nobody said what the doctor had to do. You just had to go to the doctor. <laughs> so the point was, these people are sick. 
but they got a program that says, well, I'm sick, but I can't heal myself. Why? Because I didn't go to the doctor. So they make a commitment, they go to the doctor, and on the way to going to the doctor, in the doctor's presence, they completed the commitment because it never said the doctor had to do anything, just had to go. Mm. And at that moment, all of a sudden, the innate ability to heal themselves start working, and then they find themselves in the doctor's waiting room feeling, God, I feel a lot better than I did when I got here. And the answer was, because you made a program of limitation, then you succeeded by following the program, I'm showing up. And, and, and that's all you had to do, because all you had to do is go see the doctor. You talk about, again in, in your first book, about how cells automatically move away from toxicity and towards nutrition. Yes. And it seems that as human beings, that's something that we're trying to do, but we get it wrong a lot of the time. We're trying to move away from un unhappiness, or what we think makes us yeah. unhappy, and towards what we think makes us happy. But we get it muddled up, don't we? Well, yeah, but the, you see, the key word you said is what we think makes that's us happy. That's right. So, yeah. I mean, I was caught in that in the old days, too. Before I became aware, I thought at one point, wow, I'm going to buy that little, you know, that car. I bought a car that looked like a Ferrari called a Pantera back in the 70s. And I thought, okay, I'm going to be happy. I, I got this great car. So I got the car. And about like three days later, it's like now I got this car. I'm not any happier. And a matter of fact, I got now three speeding tickets because every day I took the car out. Uh, of course, I couldn't go 30 miles an hour with it. So uh, <laughs> every day, it was like the car became a burden to me. And it was all of a sudden, so, well, you know, that whole program that that Ferrari is going to make you happy, that, that was a misprogram. It wasn't the car that makes you happy. Uh, and I started to find out it wasn't the material things that make you happy. What makes you happy? Love makes you happy. Good food will make you happy. Harmony in your environment makes you happy. These things are, uh, uh, harmony in the environment, where's the price tag on that one, you know? Uh, basically, having a relationship with somebody that supports you and fulfills you, where's the price tag? It, it, we always bought that, oh, money gives you happiness. So we had all, all those billions of people out there every day running in the streets. And, How much money can I make? Because if I get enough money, I'm going to be happy. And then you find out even people with the most money are not happy. And it's, it was programming was wrong. If we were programmed to seek out companionship and community and love, that's where you make us happy. Change but, the whole game. But it's almost as if we have to go through a process of finding certain things don't work to find out what does work for us. Well, that, that's true, but then the question is this. How many people go through the process, find it doesn't work, and then repeat the process and it doesn't work again? It's well, like, oh, oh, yeah, I've been married four times, somebody was saying. It's like, God, they repeated the same error yeah. already three times with the ideas. Do you think by the fourth time maybe you could learn that whatever pattern you played three times in a row will probably play itself again until you change, not your partner. <laughs> you keep bringing in the same partner with different colored hair and a different name, but you're still, you brought that person in and you play the same game over again. The question is, can you learn? The answer is you can, but do many people learn? The answer is no, because they keep thinking that it's just my fate, you know, that's just the way life is. But their subconscious still remains unconscious. That's the that's problem. The key, Until it? you change the subconscious yeah. program, you, it's, it, the subconscious is a habitual mind. It's a habit. Yeah. Until you change the habit, you will be, replay the habit. That's why it's called a habit. So you keep replaying the same program. And so, yeah, you keep, uh, you know, it's like the definition of insanity is the idea of keep doing the same thing and expect something different to happen. The fact is, no, <laughs> that's insane. Why well, you keep doing the same thing, you're going to get the same thing. And if the habit mind is giving us a story, then the answer says, well, how do I change it? And the answer is change the subconscious mind. Because that's where the habits are that we got from other people. Again, this is most important. The fundamental habits in the subconscious mind came from other people. And that's why they rarely match what you want in your conscious mind, which is you. And you create those programs, and yet the fundamental programs of subconscious were downloaded during that first six years of our development. At the beginning of the book, you have a dedication, which I really like, which I wrote out. You dedicate it to Gaia, the mother of us all. May she forgive us our trespass. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, uh, in that quote. <laughs> well, it, it, uh, when I finally started to realize a very simple truth, and it was like an old spiritual word, but I now understand the biological connotation of it, that we were made in the image of the environment. And that, so we are complements to the environment. And yet what we have done is without being aware that our biology is dependent on the environment, that we have systematically undermined, destroyed Mother Nature and Gaia. And in the process, now we're finding we're, we are threatened with our own extinction. 
And the fact is, well, we didn't know what we were doing. But the question is, uh, uh, will Gaia allow us to come back? And the answer is absolutely. Because just as much as a person can come back from the edge of death with something called the spontaneous remission, even though science has already recognized we are facing our extinction, so we could say that we're a terminal patient, <laughs> humanity is a terminal patient, um, the concept of changing our belief system will allow the garden to come right back to fullness again. So we are in a learning stage to remove ourselves from the beliefs of our current civilization, which undermine not just the humans, but the environment that, that we're in. Uh, and the problem is we were created as a complement to a certain environment. Since we destroying or are destroying that environment, then we are no longer complements to an environment. Then we don't fit by definition. And that is why the scientists recognize we are facing our extinction. So um, I like to apologize to nature, <laughs> saying, geez, I'm really sorry. We didn't get it, but we're learning. And more and more people, especially the younger people, very importantly, are recognizing you cannot destroy this environment and survive. And that we must pull together and honor Gaia, the mother of us all. Because by returning our love back to Gaia, Gaia will will give us back the love and the life that we, that we can have on this planet. Absolutely. Something you look at in spontaneous evolution too is how science and spirituality are coming together. They used to be very separate. They used oh, to be absolutely. This, the, this, the scientific world, which is very factual driven, and that's that, and you couldn't change it. And spirituality was trying to open up things, but they really are meeting now, aren't they? Yeah, it was interesting because um, the spiritual world of religion was talking about the invisible moving forces that shape the physical reality, and we call them spirit. And then science uh, only came into existence because it, it made a detente with the church. In the very early days of science, it said, look, we won't tread on your invisible spiritual domain. We will just study the physical world. And when Newton was able to predict the movements of the planet by just looking at the physical features, then scientists got the idea as well. If you can understand how the universe operates by just studying the material world, we don't need that invisible stuff. But in 1925, Newtonian physics was uh, incorporated, subsumed by a bigger physics called quantum physics. And quantum physics emphasizes the universe is made out of energy. It's not made out of matter. And then I say, well, what does the quantum physicists call this energy that the universe is made out of? And I say, well, they call it the field. I say, what's the definition of the field? I love this. Invisible moving forces that influence the physical world. I go, my goodness, that's the same definition as spiritual. It's used for spirit. I go, yes, quantum physics emphasizing the invisible uh, field as primary to the physical world is essentially reiterating the statement of the spiritual people who talked about the invisible forces shaping our physical existence. And so, by definition, science, the new science of quantum physics, is bringing us back into alignment with the spiritual reality. Uh, hopefully, uh, the, the dogmatic beliefs of the church, which had uh, talked about these wonderful terms but didn't allow us to live there, and science, which is still stuck in its material plane, will both divest themselves of their dogma and allow us to come together and recognize that we're all part of that invisible field, that, that we don't even live in our own bodies, if you understand the nature of how the cell works, that we are part of the field being downloaded into our body, that we're all, by definition, the field, or we're all spiritual, same definition. And, and if we recognize this, the unity of it, and that you cannot be taken out of the field, and you cannot be, in a sense, punished by the field, you are the field then maybe the beliefs, those very restrictive beliefs from both science and from the dogmatic religion uh, will disappear because the people owning their own spirituality, owning their own responsibility and not saying, oh, it's spirits that did this or things, other factors, that we are the creators, will generate a new world because what I firmly believe is very simple. Go out and talk to the average person anywhere in the world and say, so if you could create a world, what would you like? Well, I'd like a world where there's peace and harmony and I like some food and a job. And I go, isn't it amazing how everywhere you go in the world, virtually the entire population has the same belief? And I go, then how come we don't have any answers? Because the leadership isn't exercising that belief. So I trust the people to take over the leadership of this world and that the structure that is is actually in a state of collapse 
when it collapses, this will be our opportunity to evolve from the very destructive Darwinian perception of the world into a more holistic holism that says we're all part of the same system, we're all cells in the same body, and when we work together, we will create magic on this earth like nothing has ever been seen before. So I'm very optimistic about that. I think that's a great place to finish, Bruce. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. I so appreciate this opportunity. And I just want to do a little uh, plug here for uh, Bruce's two books, Belief of Biology, Biology of Belief, rather, and uh, Spontaneous Evolution, which I had as a talking book, which I really enjoy listening to in the car. So thank you, Bruce Lipton, and thank you for watching Conscious TV. Hope we see you again soon. Goodbye.